Hey, welcome to St. James Church Online. My name is Miles. Uh, I am the discipling young pastor here at St. James. Uh, welcome to the month of July. Uh, for us as a church, this is a month of uh, experimentation. Um, uh, every week we'll look slightly different as we work out what church looks like in this particular season. Uh, sometimes people are meeting with people on site. Sometimes uh, youth and kids are off site. Sometimes people are meeting in their homes or they're meeting in other people's homes. Uh, this is a moment where we're trying to gather um, and work out what that looks like, but it is, it is experimentation. It looks a bit different each week. And in this season, uh, the one thing that binds us together is not uh, the habit of what a Sunday looks like. Uh, in this season, what gathers together is, is the gospel, the beauty of what Christ has done. 1 Peter 3 says this, uh, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Christ suffered that we might be brought to God, the righteous one for the unrighteous ones, us. And so in this season, uh, there's a whole bunch of unknowns, a whole bunch of complications, but there are some knowns. What we know is the reason we gather, what binds us together is Christ. The one, the righteous one who suffered for the unrighteous, that we might be brought to God together. And that is what binds and joins our gatherings, uh, though uh, uh, apart, they are together in the wonder of the gospel. Now, if you're new with us uh, today, we'd love to know that you've connected in with St. James. If you could fill out a connect card on our website, uh, just click on St. James, St. James Church Online, uh, you'll be able to find a connect card there to fill out so we can um, connect with you and share with you more about what we are on about as a church. Today, uh, we have Al bringing us a sermon from Romans 1. We have our band uh, sharing with us a song to uh, allow our hearts to sing and rejoice in what God is doing. And today, as we gather as church, uh, we do it in light of the goodness of God. Let's do church. Well, congratulations on making it to Sunday, July the 5th, the first of our experimental July Sundays. Sunday, July the 12th, next Sunday, will be different. We will not be having a Sunday kids and youth program, and we're planning for all our kids and youth and their parents to join church online next week rather than coming into church. Those who aren't our kids and youth or their parents are invited to come into church at 8.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m. or 7 p.m. I hope to see you there. Also starting next week will be a three-part sermon series called Encounter God, where we're focusing on the central Christian message of how Jesus enables us to connect with God. This would be ideal for anyone who's clarifying their understanding of the Christian faith. And I warmly commend it to you and to anybody that you might want to bring along or share the link with. Finally, this week we're supporting a fantastic Christian ministry uh, reaching out to indigenous people in the Redfern area. It's called Living Waters. It's a small church plant that's been going for a few years and several of our St. James members have been directly involved. We're going to see a short video and there's links with uh, details of how you can support it on our website or in your email inbox. So for a long time there was like water coming down through the corners. You can sort of see still on that side. So um, that's why they stripped all that back and are redoing the whole thing there. Like re-rendering all of it. But yeah. So this is the start of the new space here, so you can, yeah, it's a bit sketch at the moment, but... Yeah, so I think we've, we've seen recently, haven't we? We've seen in the news, we've seen in the media that growing up as a young person in the inner city can be a really tough time for people. And um, yeah, so our, our goal and our vision here is we want to create a space. We want to create a really safe place where these young people can come along. Um, they can feel comfortable. They can learn about the love that God has for them. And yeah, they can feel comfortable like this is their place that we've made for them. So that's what we hope to do in this project is create that safe place for them. So 
Oh, some of the boys of the, around here, you know, out every night, you know, trying to find somewhere to stay in that, you know, and there's people that are less fortunate than others, and like you know, I'm 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 lucky to have like a good mum that looks after me, and my brothers. You know, she makes sure I have food. I mean, my brothers have food and shelter and that. Um, and yeah, you know, there's other people out there that don't have that kind of stuff and that privilege. So you know, the, the, the space that we're going to get, you know, that hopefully that the people that um, that don't have the privilege can come by, you know, you know, make them, you know, feel at home, um, safe and everything. And yeah, that's that's it. Let's pray. Father, you are our God, merciful and just, gracious and true, loving and purposed. In this time when things are well out of our control and the regular things of life seem to change in a moment, draw our hearts to rest in your Lordship. Lead us to abide in you. Help us to dwell in the refuge of your relationship with us. There are moments when we uh, think that COVID-19 is over and then it seems far too quickly that we realise it is not. Father, particularly we pray for those for whom life has not returned to normal at all. Those for whom uh, their family circumstance means they still live uh, in fear and threat. Father, we pray that you would give them peace that surpasses understanding while they're in isolation. And for those who aren't, uh, protect them from seeking peace in anything that is not you. Father, wherever we are, whatever our circumstance, uh, we pray that Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 would be true. That his word to the Ephesians would be words for us. We pray uh, that you, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. We pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us, that the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people and your incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And you, Father, placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over us, everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Hi, I'm Lauren from the 7pm congregation and I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now, at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, 
but have been prevented from doing so until now. In order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Well, here we are. Sunday, July the 5th, at last. And today is a momentous day for every single person at St James Croydon. Actually, that's not quite right. For those of us who are here in person today, in the church and in the hall, eh, it'll have to do. We're physically distanced, we're on our plastic chairs, there's no singing, there's no supper or afternoon tea. And it's not for every single person at St James because the plan was that about one in three of us wouldn't even be here today and would still be joining church online as we have for the past several months. It's a bit anticlimactic in some ways. I mean, is this what we've been waiting for all this time as lockdown starts to ease back? We had a growth group leaders meeting a few weeks ago and there were some great questions raised. One person said, as I explained the plan for this Sunday, what are you trying to achieve with all this chaos? It's a fair question. Another person said, if I describe this and someone says, why should I come to church, what should I tell them? In choosing a passage for today, those questions were in the back of my head. And as you might expect, it occurred to me maybe to preach on Hebrews chapter 10. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. Or perhaps from Ephesians chapter 3. His intention was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Or even from 1 Corinthians 12, you together are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. But I ended up going for... Romans chapter 1. It's a passage in which the word church doesn't even appear. But instead, the word gospel is used again and again and again. I invite you to take out your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 1. In this letter, Paul is writing to Christians in the most important city on earth. It's a group of Christians that he's never met, but that he's intending to visit. How will he introduce himself to them? Should he begin by saying something like, my name is Paul, I'm the world's most significant living missionary, you might know me from such publications as my Epistle to the Galatians. Instead, he takes a different approach. Look there in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel of God. And that preoccupation with the gospel dominates the passage. He uses the word again and again in verse 1, in verse 5, uh, in verse 9, 15 and 16. It's a bit odd. You'd really expect that he'd spend more time at the start of the letter explaining his own biography and talking about meeting up with them. But he leads with the gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, he gives a summary right here. In verse 2 he says, The gospel God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son. In other words, the gospel is about Jesus. This might seem obvious to us, especially those of us who are regular churchgoers, but it is amazing how misunderstood this is. Just in the last week, I was chatting to a non-Christian guy who was happy to identify himself in that way. And as we got chatting, he wanted to talk about Jesus and his understanding of Jesus. 
you know what, I was so relieved. I actually congratulated him. I said, at least you understand what the central issue is in being a Christian or a non-Christian. What it means to be a Christian is not primarily about what you think about the Crusades or, or sexual ethics. The gospel is about Jesus. And so Paul goes on in verse 3, God's son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's some strange expressions in there. As to his earthly life, what does he mean by that? If you were describing my life story, you wouldn't say Al Lacabio, who, as to his earthly life. What it's signaling is that the Son of God existed in all eternity and only became a human being and lived an earthly life for our sake. He goes on to say that Jesus died, died, as only sinful humans should die. And he was powerfully raised in victory over sin and over death. That is the gospel. And individuals and communities that are created by that gospel are powerfully Jesus-centric. And so he says in verse 5, Through him we received grace and apostleship to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith, for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. It's all Jesus-centric. The gospel is an announcement about the risen Jesus. It's an announcement, but it's not mere information, as though it can just be sealed up in the Bible and left to sit. It's unleashed in a call to belong to Jesus Christ, which is how he describes the Romans. You Gentiles who are called to belong. Now, why start a letter to strangers focusing on Jesus and the gospel? Well, the scholars have a number of theories. They say Paul needs to establish his credentials and so forth. And I dare say those, those ideas have their place. But in a sense, where else would he start? These are fellow Christian believers. What else does he have in common with them? He starts with what truly unites them. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What better to focus on? And I could say the same about us today. Both here in physical church, but also in church online. What better to focus on than the gospel of Jesus? See, in the end... For Christian people, when we gather, our focus is not ourselves. It is Christ. And our greatest joy is not seeing one another, but Christ. What pains us who have gathered physically today about not being able to sing is the fact that we love singing of Christ. And he describes them you also among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. In other words, when we come together to church and we see one another, we are seeing the work of Christ who has called these people to belong to him. Church online is great. I thank God for it. But church online can't confront us with the work of Christ in another Christian believer the way that physical church can. Church is great, but Christ is greater. Church exists to focus on Christ. Just a couple of weeks ago, one evening, a question was relayed to me from a thoughtful person who's inquiring into the Christian faith. And the question was this, if I had to sum up Christian belief in a single word, what would it be? I really racked my brains over this. It was during the uh, Amazing Grace sermon series. So my first thought was, grace. 
And then I thought, no, no. How about love? I literally sat up in bed later that night and realised that neither one of those was the right answer. The answer is Christ. Christ is the focus. And can I say, if you are not a Christian believer and you're joining us physically in church today or maybe via church online, can I say the key thing to investigate is Jesus Christ. Think what you like about church and the people here or the production values of church online. But the decisive question is, who is Jesus? Coming up over the next few weeks, we're having a special series of three messages called Encounter God. And we're going to be focusing specifically on the importance of Jesus. I really recommend that you tune in or show up for the next three weeks if you're able, as we focus on Christ. Well, eventually, in this early passage in the letter, Paul comes to the issue of actually visiting these people. And he explains at least part of his motivation for the visit. He says in verse 10, I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. It's interesting that this passage comes at the start of the letter to the Romans. One of the greatest New Testament scholars of recent decades wrote this. He said, Romans is arguably the single most important work of Christian theology ever written. And so I asked myself, why did Paul bother visiting? Why didn't he just say, I think I've pretty much nailed it in this letter. Have a read, send me any questions. No, he says his desire is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. See, there are some things that a letter can't do. There are some things that Zoom can't do. There are some things that Church Online can't do. That mutuality that Paul speaks about in the letter to the Romans. And notice what he intends to do when he arrives. He says in verse 15, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. He means the Christians. And a bit earlier, he's just said he wants to impart to them a gift to make them strong. In other words, the gospel is not just for people who haven't yet become believers or heard about Jesus. The gospel is what strengthens and reinforces Christians in their faith and in their life. That's why at St. James, whatever the particular passage is, we make sure that we preach the gospel every Sunday. And for Christians, we don't start with the gospel and then move on to philosophy and ethics and other matters. You never completely leave behind the gospel. And then comes this great verse, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. The power of God that brings salvation. He does not mean the power of God that brings conversion, as if, as if the gospel is for your very first encounter, and after that, more sophisticated matters follow. It is the gospel which keeps us growing up and walking forward in our salvation. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 is a popular memory verse, and quite rightly, I commend it to you. But do we believe it? It's a massive claim, actually. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. The power of God that brings salvation. See, in practice, I find, especially for Christians who have a burden for people who aren't believers and who are in their lives, it's easy to actually move on from the gospel to start to believe that 
A youth group is the power of God that brings salvation. Or Alpha is the power of God that brings salvation. Or church is the power of God that brings salvation. Or, or a great session of praise and worship is the power of God that brings salvation. Maybe there's something in your heart that you think is the decisive thing that will help your friend come to Christ. You think, if only this person could, could read this book that you've come across. I've even had it applied to me as a pastor. People will say, look, I feel like if only my husband could meet you, I'm sure he'd like you and that would help him become a Christian. It's a chilling thought for me. Now, it's true that particular books and particular encounters can play their part, but only the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. I've fallen into this trap myself. A few years ago, there was a young guy who became part of our, our family circle. He went to a church school. He had Christian friends. He had heard the gospel. And I, I took it into my head that if I could just get this guy to kick, he would become a believer. I became increasingly convinced of this. I prayed that he would go to kick. And to my great excitement, he accepted an invitation and signed up. He went to kick and he came back not a Christian. And I realized that I had started to believe that kick was the power of God that would bring salvation. Now, I continue to pray for that guy and I'm optimistic in the Lord that he will become a believer. But if he does, it will be uh, because of the gospel. He might come along to church on a day when the tech is glitchy and the music isn't great and the sermon is boring. But if the gospel is preached, that may be the day when he experiences the power of God for salvation. It is the gospel that we preach and that we trust and where God's power is shown. The Christ-centric gospel which draws us together. Well, this is the start of a new season as we gradually move back to face-to-face -face gatherings. And I have to tell you, I have lost count of the number of times I've said in the past several months that we're going through a strange season. But you know what, in a sense, so what? Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. The gospel is not seasonal. The gospel is unchanging and eternal. The 19th century Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said this, how should we go out to meet the future? When the sailor is out upon the sea, when everything is changing around him, when the waves are constantly born and die, then he does not stare down into the depths, for they change. He looks up at the stars. And why? Because they are constant. By what means does he conquer the changing conditions through the eternal? Who knows what church will look like in a fortnight or in a month or in six months? But in one sense, what does it matter? Christ is our risen, eternal Lord. He is constant and unchanging, and he is our cornerstone.
Stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone. 